All right, so let's get started. <laughs> so Oceania is the largest region of the world, and it's most scarcely populated. So when we're talking about regions here, Polynesia alone covers 10 million square miles of land, of, of water space. Uh, when we get into Melanesia, another 3 million square miles of terrain. So we're talking about huge territories, huge swaths of ocean with small island populations. This encompasses Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, and the islands of the Philippines. So it's really a trans-oceanic region. We're going to talk briefly about the prehistoric migration of these people. More than one million years ago, Homo erectus, which was the predecessor of Homo uh, sapiens, Homo habilis, Homo floriensis, they came all the way across from Africa to the southeast coast of Asia. And as you can see here, they found some tools on the island of Flores that date to 800,000 years ago. So almost a million years ago, people were traveling out into the water to see these islands, to explore. And these were our predecessors. This suggests that this one human that they did find might have been able to cross short water gaps in order to reach the island of Flores. Homo floriensis, they named this after the island of Flores, stood more, little more than three feet tall. So when we're thinking about hobbits, for example, in Middle Earth, where New Zealand, where uh, much of Peter Jackson's epics uh, were filmed, we're talking about people now 800,000 to a million years ago that were a little more than one meter, three feet tall. They existed on this island until about 50,000 years ago, which coincides with about the same time that modern humans arrived. So as you can imagine, modern humans arrived and made quick work of these little people. Homo floriensis was likely descended from an early dispersal of Homo erectus and survived in isolation on the island. So when they arrived at the island, there was nothing else there, just the natural flora and fauna. There was no other pre-humans at this time. So they existed there for, imagine, 800,000 years, almost up until 50,000 years ago. A remarkable population. Early human migration is divided into these four regions here. You'll see Polynesia. I apologize, this is actually a Spanish language map. Micronesia to the north, Melanesia in between, and Australia. These vary greatly as to when they were populated by humans, about 70,000 years ago in Australasia to 3,000 years ago in Polynesia. So we're talking about a huge difference in time here. Australia was populated probably 50 to 70,000 years ago. They came out of Africa, went across Asia, descended into, the, uh, in, into China, and came across these waters much later. The early people came in from New Guinea all the way into Australia 50,000 years ago. And of course, we take a look at New Zealand, and New Zealand wasn't populated until roughly 700 years ago. So we're talking about 50,000 to 70,000 years ago in Australia, and the most recent population in New Zealand was 1,280. So remarkable. The Pacific migration was arguably the most expansive, an ambitious maritime dispersal of humans across any of the world's oceans or seas. Today we found archaeological, linguistic, and genetic data that gives evidence for when these people arrived and how they lived. The earliest migration to Australia took place about 50 to 70,000 years ago. So they left the continent of Africa 70,000 years ago and took approximately 20,000 years to migrate to Australia. The earliest human remains are that of Mungo Man. This is a recreation, which are approximately 40,000 years old. So we know at a minimum that human beings have been on the continent of Australia for at least 40,000 years. So 
when did the ancestors of indigenous Australians arrive? Well, we're not really sure to be, get, to be specific. Most people would say that it's about 50 to 70,000 years ago. However, there are groups of people who say that it's probably likely that it was as far back as 125,000 years ago. So that changes the entire model that we know of the human dispersal from Africa across the world. And why would they say that? They say that it might be about 125,000 years ago because they believe that some of the more recent dispersals to Australia would have been 50 to 70,000 years ago. And they say this because there are so many different tribes in Australia. When the Europeans arrived, there was 500 to 900 linguistic groups alone on the continent of Australia. So imagine what that would mean. It would mean that there might, might have been successive waves of human migration settling in different parts where they would have their different, ling different linguistic cultures. Or it could also mean that they did arrive at one time and continue to expand and differentiate themselves. And then the question becomes, why would they leave their community? Why would they disperse across this continent, which at that time would have been pretty unfavorable for their distribution and for their dispersal across the continent? Now we'll talk a little bit about the early migration of Melanesia. The first settlers of Australia, New Guinea, and the large islands to the east arrived between 50,000 and 30,000 years ago, when Neanderthals were still roaming Europe. So we're talking about modern humans arriving here in this area 30 to 50,000 years ago, when Neanderthals were still roaming Europe. There's an interesting uh, topic that's being discussed in, in many of the uh, anthropological circles, which talks about the true, hu true humans. And the comments are that the true humans were those that came out of Africa and didn't mix with other types of proto-humans. So much of what we know as European descendants, much of us here, are actually descended by a combination of Homo sapien and Neanderthals. And so that's consequently why many of us men have large foreheads and we have the protruding bellies when we get to our middle ages. It's very true. It's, it's one of the things that we don't see in other types of humans. So when we look at the Africans, which are the purest form of humans, and then we look to the Aborigines as well, we'll see different stock of humans. And so consequently, most of us who come from European descent are actually a mix of both Homo sapien, Homo sapien and Neanderthal. How interesting is that? You can see it at many dorm uni university dorms when the men are eating. That's when the Neanderthal really comes out. <laughs> the original inhabitants of these group of islands, now Melanesia, were likely the descendants of the present-day Papuan-speaking people. So they migrated from Southeast Asia, and they occupied these islands as far as the Solomon Islands. They were known to be superior sailors, Neolithic Australasians. So when we were talking about Neolithic, Neolithic means the new Stone Age. So when we talk about Paleolithic, that means the old Stone Age. So that's much longer. The Neolithic period is really when we're talking about the new Stone Age. So we think about this during this period of time was when the Stone Age was happening across much of Europe. And so this period is also spoken about in the South Pacific as well. They settled the north coast of Papua New Guinea and the Bismarck and Solomon Islands. And at this time, what was unique about them, we're talking about Neolithic humans, they brought with them domesticate, domesticated chickens and pigs and some crops for farming. Now, why is this interesting? It's interesting because these early humans were by and large hunter-gatherers. They followed the food. So when we look at even the, the people today in the Amazon, for those of you who are part of the world cruise earlier uh, when we went up the Amazon. These ancient tribes, some of which are still present there today, follow hunter-gatherer patterns. So they will follow the food throughout the forest and they will slash and burn areas. They'll do some crop plantings, but then when they've used up the animals in that area, they'll move on. And the same thing happened with early humans. And what's unique about these Neolithic Austronesians is that they actually were one step ahead. They had domesticated chickens and pigs, and they started to bring their own crops, which also speaks to the idea that they were doing this deliberately. 
that they weren't accidentally sailing to these areas. How many of you take an act, a short drive from home and bring you know, all of your food for the next three years with you? You don't, right? And so we get some idea that when these people were traveling with these animals and their crops, that they meant to go someplace to stay. It speaks of a deliberateness of their journey. These early voyagers were the likely ancestors of the Lapita culture. The Lapita culture were the ones who went to Fiji and then continued on through most of Polynesia. Micronesia, let's talk about Micronesia for a bit. The Micronesians settled there over 4,000 years ago, and there are competing stories about how and why Micronesia was settled. And the reason we don't know a lot about why or how they were settled is because most of the evidence has been destroyed over the years because of the large numbers of tropical storms over the air in, in that area, and it's very difficult to conduct archaeological expeditions. So as a result, most of the information that we have today is based on linguistic evidence. And what we do know is that in Micronesia, there is a broad diversity of language. The Polynesian people are by linguistic, archaeological, and human genetic ancestry a subset of the Austronesian people. So by tracing their linguistic roots, we can place their origins, and we know today that the people of Polynesia actually came by way of Taiwan. So we can see genetically, we can see linguistically, the connections between the Polynesian people and the people from Taiwan. Between about 3000 and 1000 BCE, these speakers of Austronesian languages began spreading from Taiwan into the islands of Southeast Asia. Take a close look for a second at how far these people would have come from the Malay Peninsula and then gone all the way back to Madagascar. It would seem to make sense that the people from Africa would have gone off the coast of Africa directly to Madagascar, right? The first migrations actually came by way of the Malay Peninsula, and then later they would have come from Africa. So much of what we know of Madagascar today actually is African roots, because those early succession, those early waves of people were eliminated by the later humans that came from Africa. But it's said that the first migrations of human came from the, from the Malay Peninsula all the way to Madagascar. And then you can see that they extended all the way to Rapa Nui, which is Easter Island, and then the last uh, settlement would have been in New Zealand. These natives were thought to have arrived through South China about 8,000 years ago and spread to the islands of Micronesia and into Melanesia. And these people are different than the Han Dynasty people. Uh, the more majority of these people today are in uh, China and Taiwan. So how did humans spread across the Pacific? Now we're talking about they've reached the edge of these islands, how are they spreading across the Pacific? About 3,000 to 1,000 BCE, expansion out of Taiwan via the Philippines. About 1,400 BCE, they would have gone from Eastern Indonesia, uh, from New Guinea, and into the islands of Melanesia. And then at about 900 BCE, expansion into the Western Polynesian Islands. And it was much later then that they expanded into the Eastern Polynesian, as we spoke about about 1280 when they finally arrived in New Zealand. And this theory is supported by current human genetic data, linguistic data, and archaeological findings. How many of you have heard of Thor Heyerdahl? Fantastic. So Thor Heyerdahl wanted to test these theories of human migration. The common understanding was that these people came from Africa, went through Asia, descended into the islands, and then continued to populate the Pacific Islands all the way to the eastern Polynesian islands. While Thor was satisfied with some of that, he wasn't completely satisfied because it didn't explain some of the connections that he saw and understood about these people. How was it that they had stone builders which were similar to the styles of the Incas? How is it that they have similar words for the sweet potato and similar crops that also came from South America? He wanted to help find an explanation for how these people might have been connected to the people of South America. So in 1947, he sailed 5,000 miles on a raft that he and his friends made out of balsa wood and pine logs, and they sailed all the way from South America to the Tuamoto Islands. Unbelievable for that time. Unbelievable even for today, mind you. 
The expedition was meant to demonstrate that these ancient people could have had a connection. The ancient people of Polynesia could have had a connection with the people of South America. And this is a diffusionist model. So the diffusionist model is the idea that even though we may say that these people of Polynesia and Melanesia and Micronesia were populated by the people from China and that they would have differentiated over this period of time, the diffusionist model is the idea that other cultures may have had contact with them, with them and diffused some of their own culture into Polynesian culture. So it helps explain then, from a diffusionist perspective, how these cultures had some of these traits from South America. The Contiki, demonstra the Contiki demonstrated that it was possible to sail a primitive raft 5,000 miles using the trade winds with relative ease and safety. They are also able to prove that the raft was maneuverable and amazingly that large numbers of fish in the middle of the ocean started to congregate under the raft for safety, for protection. And so consequently, Thor was actually able to fish and live largely off of the ocean instead of using the foodstuffs that they had packed to bring along. And they were also able to figure out this idea of how to stay hydrated by catching and eating abundant resources of fresh fish, eating them raw, they were able to take in the nutrients of these fish, including the water that was uh, hydrated in the fish. Anthropologists continue to believe that Polynesia was, in fact, populated from the west to the east, not from the east to the west. But there are there is evidence of some po South American Polynesian contact. As I mentioned, the South American sweet potato, the kumara, is actually found throughout Polynesia. You can also find stone carvings in many of these islands, particularly when you get to Rapa Nui, and then you get to some of the Marquesan Islands. You'll see evidence of stone carving that isn't evident in some of the other islands. You find little bits of stone carving, but most of the islands had wood carving. So why was it that some groups of these people decided to start carving in stone? Was it because of the materials, or was it because they may have received instruction from other peoples about how to carve in stone? And we certainly see this, interestingly, in Rapa Nui with the Moai of Easter Island. We see these large these statues, humanoid statues that face inward and has left us questioning why. We know much of the reasons today, but the questions really remain, why did they decide to carve in stone? Why did they decide to use up all of their wood resources to bring that stone down to the beach area? So there's a number of things here that are, are interesting from a diffusionist perspective. And blood samples taken in 1971 and 2008 from Easter Islanders actually determined that there was some mixture of South American blood in the groups from Easter Island. So a little bit of proof for Thor Heyerdahl, but not as much as he would have liked. How did they migrate out of Africa? When we think about ancient Africa, 50 to 70 to 125,000 years ago, we know that this was really a paradise. It was a beautiful place with abundant flora and fauna, beautiful tropical paradise. And if they wanted to explore, they really were unable to because they would have had to have gone north, which was a desert wasteland. And hunter-gatherer peoples had to follow the food. So if you were facing a desert and you didn't know how far that desert went, you simply wouldn't cross into that desert because there was abundant food in the area where you came from. So it was only when the, the weather started to get a little bit drier in southern Africa and they started to be forced as the animals started to migrate out that these earliest peoples migrated with the animals similar to what happens in South America today with some of the Amazonian tribes. So they would have followed some of these animals eventually all the way to Australia and to North America in the other direction. Climate controlled the production of food. They would have followed that food no matter where it was going, and they would have kept on following it until it was depleted. Populations may have been blocked from further migration because of barriers like high seas or glaciers. So we think about high seas as they would have reached the uh, Malaysian Peninsula, as they would have reached the Philippines. And as these same groups of people now would have traveled through up to Siberia, 
uh, and over the Bering Strait into North America, they would have been stopped there by ice. As a matter of fact, one large group of uh, early peoples was trapped there for 10,000 years until the ice melted and they were finally able to go south and populate the rest of North America. There's also a theory that some of these early people were very adept seafarers and consequently didn't need to wait for the ice to melt in North America up by Canada and Alaska. They would have been able to carry on their sailing all the way down the western coast of the United States and then to enter the coast from California or Washington and cross into the United States and then go further south. And of course, these peoples were our Native American peoples, and they would have gone on to become the Aztecs, the Olmecs, the Toltecs, the Maya, and the Incas all the way south into South America. So it's the same group of people that we're talking about that's differentiated by place and by time. South Asia was a hub for thousands of years until dropping sea levels opened up new migration routes. Siberia was also a gathering spot, as I mentioned, until people were allowed to cross because of the uh, thinning ice. Pacific migration was driven by impulses which were both universal and personal. Why did they travel? Why do you travel? Right? We, we tend to put these people in a very different position from our own. But the basic truths are that they were curious like we are. They wanted to be able to explore and to see other parts of the world. There was a sense of personal discovery. Among their tribes, there was a sense of prestige. Who would be the first, much the same as today? A sense of adventure, wanderlust, and curiosity. These were all the reasons that drove those earliest peoples as it drives us today. They explored essentially because they could, because they were skilled navigators. The question is, how did they settle the region without any real navigational tools? Well, each group has a myth about one of their local heroes who went on to discover and to discover that territory, whether it's Tonga or Hawaii. Uh, we'll talk about Kupe in uh, New Zealand. Each of these tribes has their own mythical hero who left where they were from to go out and to start this, new, uh, this voyage to a new place. Some of them were accidental voyages. These were people who went out for a day trip uh, or maybe for a three-hour cruise if you watch Gilligan's Island. And they ended up far, far away from where they were supposed to be. And then they were able to rebuild and find their way back again. And after this, they were able to learn and they became seasoned navigators. As with most things, how do we become better at it? We do it. We make mistakes. We learn from our mistakes and we continue to improve. And that's really what happened with these earliest peoples. In time, they became better at sailing. They became more experienced and they learned to tell the signs as they traveled throughout the oceans. The need for more resources drove many of these people to migrate. New islands, of course, don't have any people, and they have lots of food, they have lots of animals, the reefs are abundant with fish, so it made good sense for them if they were able to take some travels and able to find new islands to sustain them, they were able to go. Another reason would be hunter-gatherer societies. They wanted to follow the food. If their island ran out of food because they had overfished an area or they had overhunted a small atoll, perhaps, they would continue on to go to a new island group. There were some deliberate migrations as well. And we know this because they took the plants and the animals, and in many times, whole villages would get on rafts and travel. If there was a chief in a village and that chief had a younger brother, that younger brother was likely wanting to be his own chief. He didn't want to grow up under the thumb of his brother. Or if there was different beliefs uh, from a tribal perspective, they might have decided to get a group of like-minded people to put all that they needed and to go find new land instead of staying on the island where they lived. So it's all been shown now in computer experiments and, and uh, all these um, uh, experimental voyages that these drifts uh, could have happened and that these trips were very much deliberate. War and exile also drove many of these people to travel. So too many chiefs, or when there was groups went to war, if you're on an island and you go to war, 
It's pretty uncomfortable to stick around if you're the loser, right? So the idea is that these people would have gathered up their belongings, gotten into their boats, and left. Keep in mind that most of these people died on their journeys. The ones that we hear about, as with any history, we only hear the history of the ones that made it. We don't hear the history of the ones that didn't make it, but the Pacific Islands we know today were populated by the lucky ones. Many of them simply did not make it. Overpopulation also drove it. When it simply became too many people on an island, they would be pushed off. The uh, less resourceful people would be physically pushed off, sent off the island uh, to survive and to go someplace else. So let's talk briefly about the names so it helps us understand a little bit about what we're talking about when we speak of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. For those of you who understand the Greek roots, this is easy stuff, but we'll go over it. Melanesia, the prefix mela means dark. So when we talk about Melanesia, we're talking about the dark-skinned people. So while it might seem that what we're looking at is island groups that are specific uh, because of their, their close grouping, what we're really talking about is groupings of people based on the humans that occupy them, okay? This is less about their location and more about the people that occupy them. Keep in mind that the Polynesian Triangle extends all the way from Hawaii to New Zealand to Rapa Nui, Easter Island. And everything inside of that, with the exception of Fiji, is Polynesian. So Melanesians are called that because their skin is so dark. Micronesians are called this because there's so many small, tiny islands in Micronesia. So because the islands are so tiny, they call it Micronesia. Polynesia is because the islands are so varied. There's so many islands in Polynesia. And so poly in Greek means many. So the islands of Polynesia are so numerous. We'll start talking about the Polynesian Triangle. As I just mentioned, the, Hawaiian, the Polynesian Triangle is bounded at the north by Hawaii, the south of New Zealand, and far to the east of Rapa Nui, the Easter Island people. The rest of Polynesia includes Samoan Islands, the Cook Islands, French Polynesia, the Marquesas, uh, Tokelau and Tuvalu, Tonga, which we'll be going to, Wallace and Fortuna, and Futuna, Rotuma Island, and Pitcairn Island. How many of you are familiar with Pitcairn Island and the Mutiny on the Bounty? It is one of the most isolated places on the planet, uh, next to Easter Island, which is called, actually, uh, in Spanish, Easter Island is called El Ombligo del Mundo, which means the belly button of the world. When you get a chance to look at a globe, if you, if, I don't know if there's a globe on the ship, but if there is, or if you can take a look online, take a look at the globe and see where Easter Island is, and you can see that if the, uh, if the world was a, a person's midriff, Easter Island would be right in the belly button. It's a very unique uh, perspective that the Spaniards gave uh, Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, El Ombligo del Mundo. Well, Pitcairn Island was, uh, now is populated by the descendants of the mutiny on the bounty. So these men who formed the mutiny on the ship, the HMS Bounty, lived there, their descendants, many generations now since past, blended with the Polynesians, the Tahitians, who were along on that voyage. And so the descendants of this island are still the direct descendants of the mutineers and their mates that were on board from Tahiti. So we're still talking about many, many generations later, a wonderful chance for those of you who ever have the interest uh, and desire to go there. It's very difficult to get there, uh, and the weather sometimes uh, stops most people from getting there, but it's an incredible voyage. And for those of you who are interested in Easter Island as well, uh, it's probably one of my favorite places on the world, in the world to visit. Uh, it's well worth it if you ever have a chance to visit Easter Island. Polynesians were typified as lighter skinned than Melanesians. So when we think about Melanesians, we talk about Fijians. Even though Fiji seems to be, is included, is inside the Polynesian Triangle, it's considered part of Melanesia because they're such dark skinned people. Polynesians are a little bit lighter skinned people and they share a common culture and origin. Polynesians migrated from Samoa and Tonga about 2,800 years ago. So when we think about migrating from Samoa and Tonga 2,800 years ago, they didn't make it to New Zealand until 1280. 
So you think how big New Zealand is, but yet how distant it is as well. They were sailing on all of the islands to the north and never bothered to look south. The Polynesian languages also form a cohesive family. What we'll find is that Polynesian languages are very similar, and when we get to Micronesia, when you think about Micronesia and you study that, you'll find that there are over 1,000 language groups in Micronesia. So remarkable. We can find that most people understand from various islands, understand the Polynesian languages. But when you get to Micronesia, it's a crapshoot as to whether or not you're going to understand the, lang the language of the island, which may be only 200 nautical miles from you. About 120,000 square miles of land spread across some 10 million square miles of water, Polynesia was the last place to be settled by humans. And they are connected to each other by linguistic, cultural, and genetic ties. So there are more than 1,000 islands scattered throughout the Central and South Pacific. Most of these islands lie east of Fiji, which serves as a rough border between Melanesia and Polynesia. Most of the islands are volcanic, although you will find some of these islands are coral atolls. Now, New Zealand is actually part of the submerged continent of Zealandia, which is interesting when we hear the story of Maui, the part of New Zealand, uh, the North Island is called Teika a Maui, which means the fish of Maui. So when you look, I'll go back one slide here to see. Oh, maybe it's a couple slides. So when you take a look here at New Zealand, to the people of New Zealand, the Maoris, they said that this was the great fish of Maui. And so the North Island is called Teika a Maui, which was the story that Maui fished up this island from the bottom of the continent. And interestingly enough, the geologic formation itself is that of a submerged continent that when the waters retreated uh, and, and the tectonic plates pushed this continent up, it actually has a similar bearing to, this, to the mythological story. 25 years before Columbus sailed his ships across the Atlantic, Pacific Islanders had already populated the islands of Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa. The early Polynesians continued east to Tahiti and the Marquesas, and then ventured all the way north to Hawaii. So what we know today of Hawaii, for those of you who have visited Hawaii, it's, for us that's, that's the quintessential Polynesia, right? It feels, everything about it is Polynesian. And the reason it feels that way is because it was settled last by the Tahitians. The first wave of people that actually settled Hawaii uh, were the Marquesans. And the Marquesans were a smaller stature people. So for those of you who have been to Hawaii and heard the phrase, the menehune, the little people, they were actually talked about as though they were smaller stature people. But in fact, they were not smaller in stature. They were called menehune because they didn't have the manna that the Tahitians had, the spiritual power, the spiritual wealth and grace. And so when the Tahitians arrived and found these people from the Marquesas already had populated the Hawaiian islands, they made them their slaves. And they called them menehune to make them little in their minds. And so the Polynesians today, when they say, hear about the menehune, they think, oh, there was this tribe of small people, these fairies that roamed around uh, the Pacific Islands, the North Pacific Islands of, of Hawaii. And in fact, it's not. It's the earlier uh, Polynesians were the Marquesans, and then the Tahitians came later. So much of what we know of Hawaiian culture today actually comes to us from the islands of Tahiti. New Zealand, as I mentioned, was the last major land mass to be populated by humans when they just landed there in the 13th century. And the descendants of these people are the native Maori of New Zealand. The Polynesians developed superior skills based on the stars, currents, flight patterns. They learned to pay attention to the clouds. They learned to pay attention to the birds. They watched the waters as they sailed to see if there was any detritus in the water, coconuts, pieces of, of um, feathers, any pieces of wood or plants. And they learned how to navigate these islands largely by trial and error. They migrated to the farthest reaches of the Polynesian Triangle on large double double-hulled canoes that are similar to today's modern catamarans. And they brought us cargo, their entire villages, plants, and animals along with them. Polynesians speak a group of related languages that come from the Malayo-Polynesian tongue, the Proto-Austronesian language spoken in Southeast Asia thousands of years ago. 
One interesting difference, as I mentioned, is that between Polynesia and Mel Melanesia, there's a much wider diversity of languages in the islands of Melanesia. It's one of the most linguistically diverse regions in the world, whereas Polynesia generally has one language per island group, there are literally thousands of languages throughout Micronesia and Melanesia. So Micronesia is the most sparsely populated of the island groups with about 500,000 people and is largely isolated from the rest of the world. One of the islands, if you get a chance to visit, is called Ikiribas. It's a wonderful destination for those of you who are uh, interested in seeing some of these small islands. Kiribati is a tremendous uh, place uh, in Micronesia, uh, wonderful for fishing as well, for those of you who, are, who enjoy fishing. So this is the Micronesian area. It is, uh, includes the Caroline Islands, the Gilbert Islands, the Line Islands, the Mariana, the Mariana Islands, and the Marshall Islands. So you can see it is north of New Guinea, it is east of the Philippines, and it's west of most of Polynesia. As you'll see, most of these islands are north of the equator, but some of those islands do straddle the equator to the south. It incorporates thousands of islands and islets, most of which are uninhabited, over three million miles of water in the Western Pacific Ocean. The people first settled here about 3,500 to 2,000 years ago, and language is what allows us to know more about these people because most of their archaeology has been destroyed because they really didn't populate their places with things of stone or things that would be of lasting value. Most of it was plant matter and would have been of wood. So the languages are strongly related to the Austronesian languages that exist in Melanesia. The language sp spoken in the West is those of Palau, the Marianas, and the Yap. Those are not related to any of the other islands. So you find this little island group area that has no ling linguistic connection to the rest of these islands. It's a curiosity. These islands on the western edge of Micronesia seem to have been settled by the Philippines and Indonesia. The large number of mutually unintelligible Micronesian languages is a sign of the region's great cultural diversity. Even today, people can travel from one island to the next and have very little understanding of what their neighbors might be saying to them. The Micronesian way of life is a very simple way of life. It's focused on stability of society and culture. They have almost everything that they need, they live in an area that is prone to cyclones and droughts, so consequently, they have a, a strong reliance on other people. They form very strong bonds with other island groups, and they maintain those bonds because it's necessary for their survival. Wars occurred in most areas throughout these islands, but after the wars, what's remarkable is that they learned to get along with each other again. And they learned to get along with each other because they learned that they had to get along with each other. You couldn't afford to have lifelong enemies when you lived in these islands. So they put their relationships back on track. If you had a relationship with someone who lived in the highland areas and you had a war with them and you were in a low-lying atoll, you needed to make sure that you put that relationship back in order because when the next cyclone came, you needed to be able to go to the higher parts of that island to be with them as the storm approached. And in the same way, during times of drought, those northern island people needed to be able to come down to their friends who lived on the atolls for fishing and for being able to live off of the ocean. So this level of interdependence is quite important. Farming and fishing is important. They've been traditionally dependent on cultivation of crops and fishing in shallow reef waters, which again bound those high land people and the lowland people together. Because arable land was in very short supply, it's very valuable. So this land is passed from generation to generation, from family to family, and it's very important how they pass this along. So succession rights are important in these islands. Loyalty and reliance is very important, as I mentioned. They needed to maintain strong relationships. Here you can see in this uh, picture of this young girl from Micronesia, you can see the clear facial similarities between her face and the people, say, of the Philippines or of Southeast Asia. You can see much more of an Asian influence here when you see the people of of Micronesia. And that starts to change, obviously, as you get more into Polynesia. They become a little bit lighter skinned and have less of the eye features that the uh, Micronesians have. <laughs> 
when the Europeans arrived, what they found was that the people of Micronesia were living life in good balance. They weren't working a lot. They didn't need to work a lot. They spent a lot of time with each other. They spent a lot of time visiting with relatives and enjoying each other's company. They had very simple houses. They were able to live off of the oceans. They were able to rely on their highland neighbor friends for their vegetables and for their foods. And so they lived this life of interdependence. And as long as their relationships were good with each other through visits and through community uh, exchanges, they were able to live in peace and in balance. One of the unique characteristics that you'll find in South Pacific Island groups is that they are very indulgent of their children, even more so than Americans, if you can believe it. We tend to establish the ability of a society, the strength of a society, is really predicated on how long we can keep our children children, right? It's how, sophistic, how we, we measure sophisticated societies. Societies that are not terribly sophisticated have their children working at very early ages. Uh, developing nations are this way. So a well-developed society is able to indulge their children. Here in these cultures, there's really no emphasis on these children to go out and do anything particular because it's already being done. You learn how to fish by going out with your father to learn how to fish. You learn how to gather fruits and vegetables by going out with your mother and your father to gather these vegetables. And whenever the time is right, whenever perhaps one of your parents can no longer do it or they require a hand, or you start your own family, then you're obligated then to take on an adult role. But they extend those roles for as long as possible so you can be a child for a very long time in Micronesia. Some newlywed couples live with the husband's family and others with the wives once they get married. And these extended groups are very important. So you go to the family, not so much who wants you, but who needs you. So which one of these family sites needs the work? Which one of them requires maybe the husband or the wife to help the tribe with that work? And that's where the family would go. Descent is traced through matrilineage in most of Micronesia. Marriage is varied in Micronesia as well. In Palau and Yap, the groom gives a gift to the bride's family. And in most of these relationships, in most of these marriages, there's an exchange of some level of wealth at the, wedding, at the uh, marriage ceremony. Considerable premarital and extramarital sex is the common norm. So even though you might say to the society, say to your culture, that we are a couple, that doesn't necessarily stop either one of them from having sexual relationships with other people. In fact, it's quite common before marriage for this couple to experiment heavily with other partners and even after marriage. And it's said to be one of the bonds that keeps people happy, that these couples understand that they have a social and they have a familial relationship with each other, but otherwise they're welcome to seek sexual satisfaction where they may. And it's been the foundation for this society, which makes it very unique because, as you know, in most Western societies, this is very much taboo, right? But here it is very, it's not the case. And so it's only, you're married when you speak openly about being someone's spouse. And in the same way, you can get divorced by simply saying, I no longer want to be married to this person. So it's very simple. Polygyny is a form of marriage in which a husband has more than one, more than one wife. This is practiced, but it was largely only practiced by high-ranking officials and chiefs mainly because the men who were of the lowest ends of the society didn't have the resources or the ability to provide for more than one, wi for more than one woman. This is going to be my, my son's favorite part because he has a 14-year-old sister. And birth order is very important in Micronesian societies. The, the oldest child, eldest child generally represents the family, and younger siblings are expected to exhibit very formal respect to their older siblings. So brother-sister avoidance is very common. Harry would love that. And sisters and brothers were tra traditionally expected to avoid speaking to one another. And when a brother, the older brother, walked into the presence of his younger sister, the younger sister is expected to bow to the older brother's presence. 
So as you can imagine, a lot of older boys would love to be growing up in Micronesia. Social and political hierarchy is very well defined. Its stratification is very clear in Micronesia. Chiefs were very powerful, and if you fell out of line with the chief, you could be punished by fines, destruction of your property, or death. A chief could simply decide that you had offended the tribe or the chief in some manner and put you to death. It didn't often happen because, of course, they needed people to participate in the tribes, but oftentimes wealth would be confiscated until such time as the offender had made amends with the chief, and then the chief would redistribute that wealth back to the other person. Chiefs often had subordinate chiefs and officials, and most chiefs had wives who were high-ranking members of other tribes. So again, here we see political reasons for marriage, right? This idea of marrying someone, not so much for love or for physical attraction, but to join together two tribes, one with the chief, the other one with a powerful woman of the other side. Micronesians were indulgent with infants, Children were inducted into life gradually through participation and observation. Uh, there was no real formal education. We'll also see here in Micronesia the interesting aspects of tattoo. This was common throughout Polynesia, but again, we can see that this tradition followed into Polynesia by first starting in Micronesia. And most tattoos are given to teenagers at the times of puberty, during their initiation rites. The most widespread of these was tattooing, which is practiced by both sexes. Uh, body adornment is also common. You'll see this throughout Papua New Guinea. Uh, but uh, it was meant to demonstrate bravery and increase attractiveness. If you wanted to learn something, if there was a medicine man that you wanted to learn from, if you wanted to learn cooking or hunting, and your father or your mother was not well versed in these, the family would often pay someone else through giving of food or offering other services to help that person train your child in the skills or the arts in which they wanted to learn. Uh, and this was very common even into middle age. So an older relative taught these skills and they would often be paid in goods or other services. Now we'll talk about Melanesia. Melanesians are distinct from Aboriginal Australians despite, despite the frequent, frequent contact. You can see it even in their faces. Their faces look different than uh, Aboriginal Australians. Melanesians are sometimes called Papuans because the Malay word for Papua means frizzy, frizzy-haired. So consequently, all of these people of, the, of Melanesia are often called Papuans. And so you'll hear that spoken perhaps also in Fiji. They'll make call someone a Papuan. And that's uh, simply a, a slang way, word for saying that they have frizzy hair. You also see in Papua New Guinea uh, one rare group of pure blonde haired people. It is an incredibly unique um, element of Papuan society that almost everyone has these dark hair except for one group of people that has the blonde hair. And it's said that there was a white man, a blonde man, that came there at one point in time, and his genes became a part of the gene pool. And so now that tribe continues to perpetuate this blonde hair gene. So you'll see these beautiful dark-skinned children with this almost white blonde hair on parts of the island. These are the islands that comprise Melanesia. You'll see the island of New Guinea, Bismarck and the Luiseda Archipelago, the Admiralty Islands, Bougainville Island, Papua New Guinea, all the way down to Fiji, Vanuatu, and the Norfolk Islands. So it's a large group that goes all the way to Papua New Guinea and extends along the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. Ancient Melanesians came with domestic pigs as early as 9,000 years ago. And keep in mind that this coincides with the dawn of agriculture in the Middle, Middle East. So when we talk about the Middle East agriculture being started at this time, at the same time, these people were crossing and bringing domesticated pigs and sugarcane. By 5,000 years ago, agriculture production had included swine husbandry as well as water irrigation. So what's unique is that at the same time these things were happening in other parts of the world, they were also happening here in the South Pacific. About 4,000 years ago, the people from Austronesia moved into the area, arriving from Southeast Asia. By 3,500 years ago, they started to create their tools and the Lapita culture. Uh, so we know this through these, the pottery that spread across from the Philippines all the way through Polynesia by the Lapita culture. 
The language became the foundation for much of Melanesia. Fiji was originally founded by the Lapita people, and they used that as a springboard for the rest of Polynesia. There are more than 1,000 languages alone on the island of New Guinea. So imagine, imagine if the United States had 1,000 languages, or Britain, or Australia. We're all so fortunate to have this ideal of one language that binds us, even two or three, but imagine having 1,000 languages. Can you imagine the signage for the roads? Many of these languages have never been documented or described. Some of these groups have 50 speakers. Others of them have millions of speakers, half a million speakers. Oral tradition was very important for these people because they had no written, uh, they had no written mythology. All of it was passed down orally. One of the tales in the Sepik region of Indonesia talks about the creation story is the separation of an alligator's head into the upper becoming the sky and the lower jaw becoming the earth. We'll hear that story of this dichotomy of upper and lower throughout all of Polynesian and Micronesian and Melanesian uh, mythology. Many of these groups also have a similar human story for creation that humans sprang from the mud and populated the earth. So here again, we see this similar idea of mankind being created from mud. The difference, however, in this myth is that the first two people are brothers. So it doesn't completely explain. Other myths then help explain the population. Christianity spread through Melanesia in the past century. However, many of the native religions are still practiced. In many societies, the original belief systems included aspects of headhunting and cannibalism. These practices are now illegal, uh, and they believe that their ghosts uh, now come back to them uh, through this plane of reality. So when they see people who come in mud or are white people, they think that they're ghosts. And incidentally, if you travel in these areas, they'll call you by the same name. They'll call you a ghost because they joke with tourists that you're so white that you must be one of our relatives that have come back to haunt us. Uh, puberty is an important rite in the Melanesian societies. They would often have scarification and tattooing, as you can see here. There was also brutal, treat brutal treatment of these young boys by the older males. In fact, up until recent times, until the 1920s, these young boys in these cultures were expected to go out and kill for their initiation rite. Keep in mind that these same traditions were used in the 1980s and 1990s and even today in gangs across much of North America. The idea that if you wanted to be a part of a gang, you had to go out and kill someone. It's also part of these tribal genocides that happened in Rwanda. So this idea goes back to somehow this idea of headhunting and that young men became men on their first killing. And this is much a part of societies that had war at their roots. Girls had less harsh puberty rights. Uh, with the onset of menstruation, they generally went into a brief period of seclusion, far better than having to kill someone, obviously. Warfare was very common. They believed that you would, uh, if you were offended by someone, it was your responsibility to seek revenge and to go out and kill those people who offended you. In some cultures, as many as 15% of male deaths occurred via war. So when you think about 15% of all men dying because of warring, homicidal raiding was very common. They would go into a village, they would kill off all the men, and then take their women. And so this also helped spread the gene pool to keep these tribes alive. Marriage occurred between people from different villages. Courtship rituals uh, took place between the men and women. Many of these courtship rituals take place even today. Among the Chimbu people, the men use singing to woo their women and take a look at how they're dressed. It's very similar to the birds of Papua New Guinea. And the birds also have these, these dances that are used. So the men of these tribes actually watch some of these native birds, learned their dancing and singing, and now sing and dance to their women uh, to woo them during this courtship period. Marriages have to be negotiated between families. There's usually a, a bride price to be paid. And there's a great deal of antagonism between the sexes. Many women, many villages have separate houses for men and women. The women provide for the food and the children. 
And the men often spend time in houses just like this uh, where they talk about important things, right? Ceremonial importance. They also, and of course women aren't allowed, so we never know how important it really is. Uh, but this, th these activities actually encouraged uh, secret single-sex cults in which they practiced ritualized homosexuality, and they had uh, elaborate initiation ri rituals and celebrated warfare. So they would sit, tell stories, uh, have homosexual relationships with each other, find reasons for that from a ceremonial perspective, and this is part of their culture. One of the greetings in the Papua New Guinea highlands, males used to greet each other by rubbing each other's genitals. And this is one of the few places in society where a firm grasp was not encouraged. <laughs> so in most of these places, however, the Western handshake has replaced this traditional form of greetings. And I'd like very much not to hear that you guys are performing this sort of a handshake around the ship. All right, so let's keep it clean out there. Thanks very much for coming.